One of the things you led in New Orleans was the idea that we should take down the Confederate monuments well before Charlottesville, well before, you know, the other things. And I think you talked to Mitch Landrieu, who was then the mayor, and you helped push that. Why did you do that? Well, with Mitch and I, we just have a middle-aged conversation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a big political conversation about the statues of anything. We were talking about our fathers, our families. And in the course of that conversation, we talked about the statue. I said, that's symbolically, we should take the statue down for the tricentennial. Robert E. Lee. Yeah, Robert E. Lee statue. My great uncle always hated that statue. That's how I knew about it. Yeah, Mitch, then he said, well, let me look in and see whose jurisdiction it is. So he, then he later, he called me, and he said, you know, I looked into this, and the damn thing is in my jurisdiction. <laughs> you know, then we had more of a, a kind of conversation. But the conversation, he wasn't reticent about it. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to give the impression that I convinced him to do it. I didn't convince him to do it. You know, you and I talked about it, and I'll remember, I said to you, when you first asked me, you said, we got to take down Robert E. Lee. I said, man, I've driven around Lee Circle thousands of times in my life. I never think about who's on top of that plan. Mm -hmm. And you paused and you looked at me like you're looking at me now and you said, I do. The soul of our beloved city is rooted in a history that has evolved over thousands of years. Rooted in a diverse people who've been here together every step of the way, through good and through bad. It is a history, our history, that holds in its heart the stories of Native Americans, the Choctaw, the Homa, the Chittimacha, Hernando de Soto, Robert Cavalier, Sir de La Salle, the Acadians, the Islenos, the enslaved people of Senegambia, free people of color, the Haitians, the Germans, both empires of France and Spain, the Italian, the Irish, the Cubans, the South and Central Americans, the Vietnamese, and so many more. You see, New Orleans is truly a city of many nations, a melting pot, a bubbling cauldron of many cultures. There is no other place quite like it in the world that so eloquently exemplifies the uniquely American motto, e pluribus unum, unum, out of many, we are one. But there are also other truths about our city that we must confront. New Orleans was one of America's largest slave markets, a port where hundreds of thousands of souls were bought, sold, and shipped up the Mississippi River to lives of forced labor, of misery, of rape, and of torture. America was a place where nearly 4,000 of our fellow American citizens were lynched, 540 in Louisiana alone, where our courts enshrined separate but equal, where freedom riders were beaten to a bloody pulp. So when people say to me that the monuments in question are history, well, what I just described to you is our history as well. And it is a searing truth. And it immediately begs the question, why there are no slave ship monuments, no prominent markers on public land to remember the lynchings or the slave blocks, nothing to remember this long chapter of our lives of pain, of sacrifice, of shame, all of it happening on the soil of New Orleans. So for those self-appointed defenders of history and the monuments, they are eerily silent on what amounts to historical malfeasance, a lie by omission. There is a difference, you see, between remembrance of history and the reverence of it. For America, New Orleans, it has been a long and winding road marked by tragedy and triumph, but we cannot be afraid of the truth as President George W. Bush said at the, at the dedication ceremony for the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and I quote, a great nation does not hide its history. It faces its flaws and it corrects them. So today I want to speak about why we chose to remove these four monuments to the lost cause of the Confederacy, but also how and why this process can move us towards healing 
and understanding each other. So let's start with the facts. The historic record is clear. Robert E. Lee, Jeff Davis, PGT Beauregard statutes were not erected to just honor these men, but as part of a movement which became known as the cult of the lost cause. This cult had one goal and one goal only, through monuments and through other means to rewrite history, to hide the truth, which is that the Confederacy was on the wrong side of humanity. First erected 166 years after the founding of our cities, 19 years after the Civil War. These monuments that we took down were meant to rebrand the history of our city and the ideals of the Confederacy. It is self-evident that these men did not fight for the United States of America. They fought against it. They may have been warriors, but in this cause, they were not patriots. These statutes are not just stone and metal. They're not just innocent remembrances of a benign history. These monuments celebrate a fictional sanitized confederacy, ignoring the death, ignoring the enslavement, ignoring the terror that it actually stood for. And after the Civil War, these monuments were part of that terrorism, as much as burning a cross on someone's lawn. They were erected purposefully to send a strong message to all who walked in the shadows about who was still in charge in this city. A piece of stone, one stone, both stories history, one story told, one story forgotten, or maybe even purposefully ignored. Now, as clear as it is for me today, for a long time, even though I grew up in one of New Orleans' most diverse neighborhoods, even with my family's proud history of fighting for civil rights, I must have passed by these monuments thousands of times without giving them a second thought. So I'm not judging anybody. I'm not judging people. We all take our own journey on race. I just hope people listen like I did when my dear friend Wynton Marcellus helped me see the truth. He asked me to think about all the people who have left New Orleans because of our exclusionary attitudes. Another friend asked me to consider these four monuments from the perspective of an African-American mother or father trying to explain to their fifth grade daughter why Robert E. Lee sat atop of our city. Can you do it? Can you do it? Can you look into the eyes of this young girl and convince her that Robert E. Lee is there to encourage her? Do you think that she feels inspired and hopeful by that story? Do these monuments help her see her future with limitless potential? Have you ever thought, have you ever thought that if her potential is limited, yours and my potential, my limited potential as well? We all know the answers to these very simple questions. When you look into this child's eyes is the moment when the searing truth comes into focus. This is the moment when we know what we must do, when we know what is right. We cannot walk away from this truth. We still find a way to say, wait, 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 not so fast. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, wait has almost always meant never. In our blessed land, we come to the table of democracy as equals. We have to reaffirm our commitment to a future where each citizen is guaranteed the uniquely American gifts of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is what really makes America great. And today, it's more important than ever to hold fast to these values and together say a self-evident truth that out of many, we are one. That is why we reclaim these spaces for the United States of America, because we are one nation, not two, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, not some. We are all part of one nation and pledge allegiance to one flag, the flag of the United States of America. This is a history we should never forget and one that we should never, ever again put on a pedestal to be revered. 
As a community, we must recognize the significance of removing New Orleans Confederate monuments. It is our acknowledgement that now is a time to take stock of and then move past a painful part of our history. Anything less would render generations of courageous struggle and soul searching a truly lost cause. Anything less would fall short of the immortal words of our greatest president, Abraham Lincoln, who with an open heart and a clarity of purpose calls on us today across the ages to unite as one people when he said, with malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work that we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. God bless you all. God bless New Orleans and God bless the United States of America.